<clears throat> We're starting a new series. Uh, Chris launched us off last week. And I want to take about 15 minutes here or so uh, just to kind of paint the picture of what we're going to look at over the next five or six weeks. Um, and then we'll jump into the scripture today. Um, but let me start by saying this. Many of you know already that, boy, almost 30 years ago or so now, I went to film school and I worked a bunch of years in television and film. And I remember in that very, very first semester of film school, uh, we were all sitting there and we were all new to this and the professor uh, sat us down and, um, and, and one of the things he did is he says, I want you all to learn every area of filmmaking, every role, every job, and get really good at all of it. But most importantly, there's gonna be one area that's best suited for you and I want you to find that. And the more you know all of the areas, the better you're going to be at that one thing. And he went on to describe different aspects and different roles. Like, like, for example, he described the director. And the person who would actually take what's written on paper and make it come to life. It's the person with, with the best visual creativity skills, but also the ability to work with people and make those things come to life. He talked about the writer who's really the storyteller and good with words and the imagery. Uh, there's an, a part of both of those that, that the communication that happens necessarily without the words and there's the communication with the words and how they fit together. He painted those two pictures really, really well. I mean, he talked about the, the technical aspect and the camera and the lighting and all those kind of things and the precision necessary for that. He talked about the actors and he talked about the producers and, and maybe the best picture of the producer was they're not hands-on, but they're the ones that are organizing, administrating, They've got to put all of the right pieces in the right place and make sure it's working in a cohesive way. But what he did, he took a long time, a lot longer than I did, and, and he took each of these positions and described them so well that it was really, really easy for every single one of us at some point to go, hey, that's me. And we knew, and, and, and the words he used is, one of these roles will excite your heart more than any of the others. The words he used, I think, is it'll make your heart vibrate. And I remember that clearly. I remember the point in that where it was me, and I knew that, and I got excited about that. Now, this isn't a film set. But a lot of those things are like real life. A lot of them are like what happens in our families. Uh, maybe those things are like parenting. And a lot of those things are like our church. We're a collection of people. And we're responsible to one another. But we're also, we have to work together for the good of God's kingdom, to make God's kingdom work. And as we all work together, this works. But it takes us all. And, and church isn't just a place where we come on Sundays. Uh, we each have God-given roles that God has made us, each of us, and wired us and crafted us specifically to fit into uh, with, with our own abilities, with our own gifts, with our own talents, with our own passions to fit into the whole for the good of God's kingdom and his church. But what happens when some people just aren't doing it? Then the whole thing limps. What happens when some people are in roles that they're not best suited for? then those people get frustrated and probably in those things aren't happening nearly as well as they need to happen. I want us all over the next four or five weeks to find out what part of this makes your heart vibrate. 
which part of it really gets you excited? How has God wired you? I think when we find that place, a couple of things are going to happen. I think uh, there will be way more effective ministry happening. But also at the same time, you are going to find way more joy in doing it. I know lots of people that are serving and volunteering in areas that are way beyond them or way outside who they are, and they come home frustrated every time, and they're not getting any joy, and it's a chore to go and do. That's not what we want to try to find out. So Chris kicked this off last week. How many of you were here last week? Okay, a lot of you, but a lot of you weren't. I'm going to show about a five-minute clip because what Chris started with last week really nails exactly what I want to try to do in the next five weeks. If you weren't here last week, would you please, would you please go and watch that video? You can find it on our website or on, on our YouTube channel. It will help you understand what we're doing in the next five weeks really, really well. Okay? If we have that video, can you pop that on now? There are no deck chairs on this boat. That is our Blue Water logo. One thing you have to acknowledge about that logo is it's a sailboat, right? You can see that, see that it's got a mast. I don't know a lot about sailboats, but I know enough to say that a sailboat that doesn't have a sail, uh, that's a problem. So this sailboat doesn't have a sail. I don't think it has any motor. I don't see any motor on it. So if this boat is going to move in any kind of meaningful and intentional direction, it's going to have to be paddled, right? Okay, that's one observation you've got to make about this boat. Another observation is that it's a reasonably large boat. Like it's not kayak sized, it's not canoe sized, it's, it's not even rowboat sized. It's a fairly large boat. So if it's got to be paddled, it can't simply be paddled by one person, or two people, or six people. It's going to need a number of people to paddle this boat. Um, and so a common phrase at Blue Water has become, pick up a paddle. Pick up a paddle. We need you to pick up a paddle. We've got to row this boat together. Another thing to notice is that it's, it's not so large a boat that it has room for passengers. It's not so large that it has room for deck chairs, and that's where the phrase comes from. There's no deck chairs on this boat. This is not a cruise ship, right? This is not a, a boat that has a giant deck. There's no big deck lined up with all kinds of lounge chairs where you can just lie down and suntan while other people paddle. It's not that kind of boat. Now, notice the water. Notice that. It's kind of uh, Holy Spirity. That's good because we acknowledge our complete and utter need for the Holy Spirit to do the work of transformation. And nowhere in the New Testament do you find that uh, we just simply lie down on deck chairs and suntan while the Holy Spirit just does everything. What we do find in the New Testament is this really crazy partnership that, that God invites us into, this, this wild, divine, human cooperative where God actually invites us to partner with him, to partner with the Spirit in the work of building the kingdom of Jesus. It's an incredible thing. So if Blue Water Church is a church of 50 people, how many people do we need paddling? 50. We need 50 people paddling the boat. So pick up a paddle. There's no deck chairs on this boat. Now, Sobel Church is like 10 times bigger, right? You got a much bigger boat. So if Sobel, if there's going to be, I don't know, 500 people here today, how many people do you need paddling? 500, right? That in many churches of 500 people, there's 100 people paddling, and there's like 400 people lying on deck chairs getting a tan while the others do the paddling. And that can work. A hundred people can paddle a boat designed to be paddled by 500, but it's not going to move in any kind of optimal fashion or at any kind of optimal speed. And a hundred people can move that boat, but they will get very tired. They will get exhausted. They will get burned out. They may even get 
injured and have to just give up the paddling. And so, like here it is bluntly, get off your deck chair, <laughs> pick up a paddle, and start paddling. So the series that Dave's going to launch into next week is called, Hey, That's Me. And I don't know everything that he's going to do in this series, but I suspect that he's going to walk through um, you know, some of the scriptures, look at some different characters in scripture, see how they're wired, see how they're gifted, see what their personalities are like, see how they work with other team members, see how they engage their giftedness in the work of the kingdom. And at some point along the series, you're, you're apt to go, hey, that's me. I'm like that. I'm wired like that. I'm gifted like that. I could do that. I could pick up a paddle and I could paddle like that. There we go. For those of you who don't know Chris, uh, Chris is on our staff and he is leading our church, our daughter church in Kincardine. And I don't know if he said this last week, but we are excited. They are on the verge of uh, launching out to become their very own church out from under, underneath our leadership and our, our umbrella. And that's, that's huge. We'll celebrate with them when that happens soon. But I hope in the next few weeks that every single one of us, as we look at different people in Scripture or different scenarios in Scripture, I, hoped, I hope that every one of us at some point, maybe, maybe multiple times, we'll say, hey, that's me, and, and that we can move into action in a way that God has created us. This week on Instagram, I saw this quote, and I don't know who it, well, it's written by a guy named Anonymous. He writes all kinds of stuff, I don't know. But listen to this, volunteering is the ultimate exercise in democracy. Because we vote, right? We vote to make a difference and shape where we live. But when you volunteer, you vote every day about the kind of community you want to live in. I love that. Why do I love that? Because you want your church to be loving and caring? Then get busy. If you want a, a church with a great, kids ministry, you want a church that's, that's friendly to guests, then be that. It takes every single one of us. It doesn't mean that just one person can be friendly and, and, and don't complain about how our church is. Get busy and make it. I'm not going to ever say, I'm sorry, we don't have a grade two class today because we don't have any teachers. And I'm not interested in guilting you into serving. I'm probably never going to say, does anybody want to be on our missions committee? Because the truth is, we need people who are really passionate about missions, but not just passionate about missions. We need people who are passionate about missions and who have the capability and the will to actually make the mandate of the missions committee come to life. And we need these kind of people, and we all need to be involved like this. The church isn't about programs. I'm not going to, through this series, try to push you into being part of a program. I'm not going to guilt you into anything. This isn't about programs. It's about people. In uh, 1 Corinthians, I'm not going to read a whole bunch of this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, last week, Chris spent a bunch of his time in chapter 13, and if you were here, one of the things he says is really interesting that chapter 13 is right between chapter 12 and chapter 14. Chapter 12 and 14 are all about exactly what we're talking about. This is chapter 12, parts of it. Uh, the human body has many parts, but many parts make up the whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one. If the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not a hand, it does not make it less than part of, any less a part of the body. Nor if the ear says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? If your whole body were an ear, where would you, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part where it 
where he wants it. How strange would a body be if it only had one part? Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. And the eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. We skip down and it says, are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all do miracles? Do we all have gifts of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Now let me show you a way of life that's best of all. If I could speak in the language of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge and if I had faith that could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I've given everything to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't have love, I would have gained nothing. So the whole chapter 13 of love, which we talk about at weddings and all this kind of stuff, great example of love, it's completely and totally talking about the context of this. And how we each have a role, we need to be doing our role, but we need to be doing it passionately because we love people. Not because this is what I'm supposed to do. It's a body. And, you know, in my body, there isn't a structured program that makes my hand feed my mouth. It just happens organically because my hand does what my hand does, my mouth does what my mouth does, and it works together. I think in the church, uh, we need to be organized. We need to be cohesive, but we don't need program after program after program after program. What would it look like? if we just moved way more organically, naturally, together, cohesively, moving in one direction, intentionally and meaningful, moving forward, every part simply doing what it was created to be. Do you love babies? I know some of you. Some of you really love babies, and you can't wait for church to be over so you can find Jenna and you can go and hold Adeline. Get in the nursery! Because there's some people who probably are working in the nursery who can't stand babies. Get them out of the nursery. Do you see how this should be working? The problem is we've got a whole ton of babies in our nursery. We have a whole ton of people who love babies who won't work in the nursery. Like, does that not, am I oversimplifying it? That goes for every area in our church. Let me give you some examples. And if I mention you and you didn't want me to mention you, forgive me. But I just off the top of my head, let me think of a couple of people. Think of Ruth. Ruth sitting at the back. Ruth is somebody who loves people. And, and it, it, it appears to me like Ruth spends all of her time and all of her energy and all of her resources helping people who need help. What if the people who are wired like that were just doing it? Ruth doesn't need to be part of a program to go and find an older lady who is shut in and take her out for lunch. Shirley Perriman, Perriman's aren't here this morning, Shirley prays and is driven to pray. What if all all our people that were driven to pray, we all need to be praying, but some of us are driven to pray. What if we just started praying and collecting together with others to pray? We don't don't need to structure it and schedule it. Let's just get doing it. Carolyn and Madeline just started teaming together to go and visit people to pray. They're not on a visitation team. They're just making it happen. Don Fraser, you you all know Don because he's shaking your hand as you come in. Don is brilliant at finding somebody who's new here and making them feel welcome, engaging them in meaningful conversation. And many of you know that for yourself. And And I think 
uh, there's many, many, many more people like this who are just doing that. What if we all just did things just because that's who we were? Can you imagine how great this would be? Needs would be met. People would be engaged. Nobody would be left out. People would be walking alongside others. We'd be overcoming struggles. We'd have people following up. I, I think Doug Day. Doug's not here either this morning. Um, Doug is the kind of guy, even in his 80s, stays in touch with everybody. And, and, and I know that even his friends from high school, he knows what's happening in their lives. He's contacting them all the time. He knows when they're sick and in the hospital. He's following up all the time. If you talk to Doug about something that's going on in your life, you can bet that in a couple of weeks or, or he will follow up. Well, I think there's a whole bunch of us that are wired that way. Are we doing that? Samaritan's Purse right now, uh, just in the last few days, has already sent 40 sea containers down to Bahamas. Got an email yesterday uh, saying that they, are, they have already set up a hospital, but they're desperately in need of medical people who will go down for two weeks. And he sent me a long list of specific medical people that they need and said, is there anybody in your church that fits that, dem that, that, that description? And folks, if we are doing who we are and we're being that, this whole thing will work. But just because we're wired a certain way doesn't exclude us from other things. But when we're functioning in our sweet spot, it makes the whole thing better. At home, some homes everybody has chores. Some homes they don't. I know in, in our home, I've heard Lisa say lots of times, empty the dishwasher. Well, I could easily say that's not my job. Does it matter? Her answer would be, but you live here. <laughs> say yes, dear. But do we, do we do those things because we're asked to, because it's my job, or because we live here and we know they have to get done? What are the things around the church that have to happen? Example, evangelism. Sharing Christ with people who need to know Jesus. We all are in those relationships, and this is one of those things that Christ has commanded us to do. It's not left for the people who are great at it, although if you're great at it and gifted in that, you better be leading us in that. But it's on all of us to do. And as Chris said, there's no deck chairs on this boat. All right, I've used up almost all my time. In the next four weeks... We want to look into the Bible here for some instruction. We're going to look at three or four or five different scenarios or people uh, that, that make up these, these types of people, these types of roles. And my hope is that through all of that, there are opportunities for all of us to say, hey, that's me. And it should help us to vault in and launch in. And, and what, what I would like to see, well, actually, you know what? Enough explanation. Enough introduction. Are you with me? We have time to look at one clear example this morning. Uh, John chapter 5. This really is a simple one. It won't take us long to get through. John chapter 5. If you have a Bible, I want to read a little bit of this. Um, let me start at verse 1. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was a pool of Bethesda with five covered porches and crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. If you were here five years ago, I talked about this five years ago. And so you'll remember that uh, if, if that was a day you said, hey, this is me. But right inside Jerusalem... Um, you can see on the map there, go ahead and put the map up. You can see where the temple is. Um, right beside the temple is the Sheep Gate. 
And it's called that ancient Jerusalem was a walled city and there was gates all the way around the outside and each gate had a different name. Most of the names were for the purpose of the gate. For example, one of the gates was called the Dung Gate. They had a purpose for that gate. That was where all of the unwanted stuff and the garbage and everything went out there. That's where the dump was, okay? But all around the, 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 the gates, and they all had different purposes and meanings and directions. The sheep gate was right beside the temple because all of the sheep that would come in for the temple sacrifice would come in through that gate. They were all bred and raised in Bethlehem, and they would come in through that gate to be prepared for the soul. That was called the sheep gate. Does that make sense? So the sheep gate is right there at, um, and right at the gate of the city where the sheep would come in right by the temple. And, and there's no coincidence. We've talked about this before. There's no coincidence that that's the gate that Jesus used most often coming in and out of the city. Uh, Mount of Olives and Gethsemane and those kind of places that Jesus spent a lot of time at were right outside there. But Jesus most often would come in and out of the, sh out of the sheep gate. Um, right beside the, that gate, right inside those gates, was the pool of Bethesda. And that's what this passage is talking about here. And um, those pools were a gathering spot for sick and needy. Bethesda, the word means place of mercy and loving kindness. And one of the reasons I think Jesus came in and out of this gate most often is because that's where the needy people were. That's where the people who were sick and lame and crippled uh, would be. The people who needed mercy, the people who needed loving kindness were there. Now, uh, these pools themselves uh, have always, for hundreds of years, been in controversy because there's no other mention of them anywhere in any ancient historical writing, and it's the only time in the Bible that they're mentioned. And for, for centuries... Uh, there was no evidence of this whatsoever, and there was no Roman pool anywhere in the world that had five colonnades or covered porches. And so it was an anomaly, and it, it posed a challenge to the historical accuracy of the Bible until 1888, repairs to a small church that had been built over top of this uh, repairs that church uncovered some cool historical stuff underneath it. And they actually found the remains of a pool with colonnades. And it wasn't until 1964 when that was excavated completely and they found the whole thing. Two large pools, probably about 200 feet by 150 feet each. Big pools. Uh, with uh, five covered colonnade porches, so porches with columns, uh, one on each side and one across the middle, so five, which was odd. If they were rebuilt, they'd look something like this today. Does it give you an idea? Now get this. The walls of those colonnades were covered in frescoes, in, in, in a sense, um, ancient painted murals. And on those walls were, were pictures of angels stirring the water and crippled people walking and people being healed. They found statues of healed organs and healed feet and ears and arms. There's no question that this, there was something to the healing reputation of this. Now, here's an interesting thing. I don't know which translation of the Bible you have here. But in the translation I have has no verse 4. Some of your translations do and some don't. And here's why. Because verse 4 is a description of this. And, and it was never found. It's not in any of the original first century documents of the Bible. It seems to have been added years later as an explanation. Because cultures all around the world that were reading this would have no idea about these pools or these gates, and so it, sort, it got added afterwards as a description, uh, and our modern Bibles are taking it out now again because it's not authentic. Does that make sense? But it's sure going to help us. Uh, here's what verse 4 says. Verse 3 was crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. And verse 4 said, waiting for a certain movement of the water. 
For an angel of the Lord came from time to time and stirred up the water. And the first person to step in after the water was stirred was healed of whatever disease he had. Great explanation. So if you didn't know what the pools of Bethesda were, that sure helps us. Look at verse 5. One of the men laying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up and someone else always gets there ahead of me. Okay, whose heart just broke? That's one of those, hey, <laughs> that's me. Jesus had no real reason for going to these pools. The only healthy people that would be there would be maybe a son who is dropping his dad off for the day while he went to work, or maybe a family bringing food for, for their uh, uh, invalid family member. But Jesus had no reason to be there unless he was intentionally going there because there was needy people there. Kind of like the leper colonies that Jesus often went to. No one went there unless you were a family member bringing food or, or supplies to your outcast family member. Nobody went there. Jesus did. He went out of his way to go to where these needy people were. There are people there that need Jesus. And I think there's people here who are wired like that by God for a specific reason. There's two things in this passage that I want us to see. I think there's two different, hey, that's me here. Because you could relate with the sick man. Maybe that you're saying, hey, that's me. Actually, there's so much historical cool stuff in here that we could spend a week talking about it with insight into this culture and all that kind of stuff. But it doesn't matter much to what I'm trying to say today. But if you relate to this man, maybe this is you, and, and you're expecting God to do a miracle. And you're there waiting. And you're, you're coming to the place where God heals people. And you're there day after day after day, and maybe day after day after day, you're, you're uh, losing hope or giving up. And one of the things that I like about this guy is in all these people that are gathered there, they are there intentionally to position themselves in a place where God will move. And I wonder how often when we're in need or we're praying for something, do we actually position ourselves in a place, an open, a posture of openness to what God wants? I'm captivated by the phrase here. Jesus comes up and says, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be well? My first thought would, what a dumb question. Of course the guy wants to be healed. That's why he's there. But it's not a dumb question at all. It's not a dumb question at all. He's been there a long time, and he's probably lost hope, uh, given up. Maybe he doesn't even want to be there. Maybe his son just drops him off there every day, sort of like babysitting, and goes to work, and he can leave him there, and he knows he's going to be okay. But Jesus comes up to him, and oftentimes in Scripture, when Jesus comes to a blind man or a lame man or someone like that, Jesus will say the question, what do you want me to do for you? Do you really want to change? Do you really want to be well? A lot goes along with that. And I think a lot of times we come to to Jesus with the things we want and the things we need, but Jesus has a plan too. And are we open to what he wants to do? Are we open to the life transformation, radical, crazy life change that he wants to bring in us to really make us alive, or do we really just want to be able to walk? And I wonder about that. If I walked around this room today and said, what do you want Jesus to do for you? Is there something that we know that God is longing for you as well? What about, I really want Jesus' presence in my life. I really want to know his presence and his power. But then, then what happens when he says, 
Well, about this sin, are we really open to that presence, his control and his lordship? Verse 8 is where I left off, right? Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. And instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his mat and he began walking. This guy didn't even know. If you read on, uh, I won't read on for the sake of time now, but if you read on in that passage, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders challenged him and he didn't even know who Jesus was. He didn't know who healed him. Look at that. He didn't even know Jesus, but he obeyed him. He picked up his mat and walked. Jesus actually asked him to do something that was impossible, and he didn't bat an eye. Well, folks, we know Jesus. Do we respond like that? Does Jesus want to call you into the impossible? Are we really open to God's doing and speaking and his action and his pruning and his blessing in our lives in whatever he wants? That kind of comes along with the restoring and the healing. And maybe some of you today are saying, hey, that's me. But there's another one here too because um, maybe we're looking at Jesus and we see his heart for these needy people and you're saying, hey, that's me. Maybe as you come into the gate of the city, your thoughts immediately go to the people over there that are in need. Is that there are shut-ins and there are sick and there are hospitalized and there's poor and there's hurting and there's the broken and the homeless and the lonely. And Jesus shows us his heart here and he goes out of his way. Maybe he comes in and out of that gate all the time because that's where the needy people are. So who are the people here who are going to be going out of their way because that's where the needy people are, the people who need to be cared for. And maybe we, help you, maybe we need to help you find ways to grab hold of that, to allow you to position yourself to God to work, for God to work through you. Does that need a program in the church? What if this was one of the things that we cared for each other because this is our family? This is us. This is the people we walk with and journey with and we're doing life with and we're gathering with and we're worshiping God with. Maybe, maybe uh, I, I just want to release you to care. Just do it. Let's get busy in this. It's not hard to find broken people around us. If you're saying, hey, that's me, there's all kinds of things around the church that we have happening that are just available for you. I don't know if you know this or not, but in the kitchen there are two big freezers that Laszlo's Bistro and Luscious Bakery keep full constantly. And those freezers are there for no other reason except to provide help for people who are in crisis or in need. Do you know somebody in your, in your circle of friends who could use a meal or a box of uh, luscious pastries? They're there. Come and take stuff and get it to people. I don't even need to know that you did it. We keep these freezers full all the time. There are shut-ins. There are seniors. There's folks in nursing homes. Uh, Rudy, and most of you know Rudy, he visits the nursing homes every week just to go and cheer people up. He's not in enrolled in some program to do that. It's just him, and he's making it happen. There's opportunities uh, within our care ministry. People who like to write cards or do visits or give car rides, talk to Ken. We can make this, this structured ministry vibrant, but maybe we don't even need a structured ministry if we're all doing it. Now, I need you to do this because I'm not wired that way. That doesn't mean I'm excluded from it. I need to be caring and, and doing that just as much as everybody else. But the people who are wired that way, boy, we need you if our church is going to thrive. So let's do this. If you're saying this morning, hey, that's me, and it could be one of two different people, right? Then there's a pad of paper in the chair in front of you and a pen and before you leave this morning, if you're saying, hey, that's me, would you simply 
take that pad, write your name on it, and say, hey, that's me. Maybe it's, I, I need prayer. Because I, 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 hey, that's me is that guy laying there, that cripple. And, and, and I need God's touch. I need Jesus' touch. Maybe you're saying, on the other side, it's my heart breaks for the people who are in need. And I will go out of my way to do that. Hey, that's me. Will you write that down? I'm not going to promise I'm going to contact you. Uh, I'm not going to try to plug you into a program, but I want to be able to pray. So each of these weeks that we come to this, at the end when I say, hey, that's me, uh, then I'm going to ask you to do that same thing with those pads so that we can pray. Actually, let me pray for you now. Lord Jesus, thank you for the example here. Thank you for the example of your heart. That you would go out of your way when you're, you're doing your business, you got point A to point P and P, point A to point B and, and people to see and things to do, and you would go out of your way and stop at a place nobody else would go because there's needy people there and have a conversation with a guy who needed your touch. God, I believe that probably a third of this room is created that way that makes their heart vibrate and get excited, and they're saying, hey, that's me. God, I pray that you would move them into action with or without an organized program, that you would move us, that we would see people in need, and that we would be free and released to respond, to be Jesus in in people's lives. God, there's other people here who are saying, hey, that's me, because they're desperately in need of your presence and your touch. So, God, we ask for that. We ask that we would be open, not just to receive a miracle that we want, but they would be open for you to be who you are, for you to lead and you to guide, you to do the work in us that you want to see happen. God, may we position ourselves, all of us, position ourselves to receive from you and position ourselves to be used by you for the good of your kingdom. God, we know that we will receive so much joy and blessing in our own lives when we are thriving as a person in the way you've created us. So God, move us in that direction, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.